Because the thing is, when Midnight's was released, they were still together. It's been a long time since I've given my true opinion about the whole Taylor and Joe situation. He did not want to be Mr. Taylor Swift. I have been thinking about the Great War for months. Jack is so chaotic. I feel like that was so messy of him. Is Midnight's a breakup album? Hi guys, welcome back to the channel, it's Nina. It is tea time. It has been quite a few weeks, but now I'm finally ready to chat about this. I'm back with my iced chai and I'm ready to spill the tea on everything. You're losing me is Midnight's a breakup album. The timeline that we've all been thinking about for the past month, everything we thought we knew is different now. If you are new to my channel, welcome. I'm so happy that you're here. And if you're not new, thanks for coming back. I haven't done one of these sit down videos in a while and I'm so excited to get into it because the day that Jack Antonoff posted this photo of Taylor when she wrote you're losing me my mind just went like a mile a minute and I think I spent like hours researching and looking at everything that has happened since that day that would lead up to Taylor Swift releasing this song as a vault song completely like changing the way that I think about Midnight's as an album and all of the lyrics now I'm not somebody who likes to comment extensively on Taylor Swift's dating life I know that that that's like a hot topic and especially now when she's dating Travis Kelsey and it's so so public I still don't really like to give my two cents that much because I feel like it's one of the most touchiest subjects it just feels weird after all these years of Taylor Swift's love life being like the one thing that people talk about that I don't really like to bring attention to in like a gossipy way you know I can support repost photos of them at the game on my Instagram and just be like vocally like yes go them but I think it's been a long time since I've given my true opinion about the whole Taylor and Joe situation. So let's get into it, shall we? Okay, so when I was writing notes about this in my notes app, I was just like going through each song of Midnight's and trying to like pick out lines and things that I feel like could relate to this. Obviously, Taylor never explicitly says anything about her relationships or what went wrong or what happened. The only way we can get any Thing about any of that is through her songs and her lyrics so what I really like to do is take these like things that are you know being posted on social media and just kind of like dive into her lyrics and see if it fits in there and just kind of like you know it's like the Easter eggs it's like finding little clues and connecting them but I truly feel like you're losing me was the missing piece of Midnight's and I feel like so much more of it makes sense now after hearing it and I know it's been out for a while it was originally released on the late night edition of Midnight's that was only available as a hard copy CD at the MetLife shows and a few other eras shows. So it was not on streaming yet, but of course somebody had to go and download it and put it on the internet. So we did, I mean, I would say like the people that looked for it, you could find it. I literally just had a friend send it to me so I could listen to it and I fell to the floor listening to that song. I think I have like a video where I was talking about it originally when it came out, so I will link that down below so you can get my like initial reaction to the song. But even though technically the song has already been out, there's new information that completely changes what I think about the song. And that was when Jack Antonoff posted a photo of Taylor the day that they had written that song. The reason he posted that was because they released You're Losing Me onto stream when Taylor ended up being like the number one global artist for Spotify and so she released You're Losing Me from the Vault on streaming which prompted Jack Antonoff to post a little throwback photo and he said we wrote You're Losing Me after this photo was taken and it's her standing in Jack Antonoff's kitchen and he has the exact date which is so interesting to me that he would put the exact date that the song was written I feel like that was so messy of him to do that honestly Jack is so chaotic and 
it's just like so funny. But it was absolutely shocking. This song was written on December 5th, 2021, two years ago. Everybody thought this song had been written this year, like after the breakup or like right before it. The fact that she wrote that and was still in that relationship for two more years, I quite literally can't believe that. And of course, when Taylor came out with Midnight's, she was very clear that it was a concept album and that all of the songs could be about any time in her life, which I think was very smart of her to say that because then it kind of takes away from the speculation and you listen more to the songs and be like, well, we don't know if this is about this or that. It could be about any of these times in her life. I think some are more clear than others. Obviously, there's some that's like, oh, that's definitely from, you know, this era or about the same thing that connects to the songs in, you know, the 1989 era, whatever. But she wrote You're Losing Me way before I thought she wrote it. And I think a lot of people think that as well. The photo that Jack posted is so funny and people like zoomed in and picked apart this, totally analyzed every aspect of this photo. The first being, you know, she's eating raisins straight off the counter, not even like out of a box or on a plate, just raisins straight in her hand. You know homegirl was not doing well. And next to her is a bottle of wine. And of course people zoomed in and they had to find what label that was. It ended up being a wine label that was created by the chicks. It's rosé and it's called Gaslighter Rosé. And I thought that was so funny. It is 40 proof or 40 proof, 40%? I think it was 40%. Anyways, a very, very high alcohol percentage for this rosé. So again, you know homegirl was going through it if she's drinking that. And also somebody who works in like a BevMo or like, I think it was like a Total Wine or something came on TikTok and said, everyone's selling out this rosé. And I think everybody should know what it says on the cork. So the top of the cork says, don't let them fool you. Okay, that's not nothing. It's not something, but it's not nothing. Like that, a coincidence? I don't know. Truly poetic, if you ask me. Dare I say, your roommate's cheap ass screw top rose. It's not screw top though, it's a cork. So I don't think that parallel can be drawn exactly. So I'm gonna give you my overall what I think, and then I'm gonna go into some lyrics here because that's what I really want to do to like kind of prove my point. But essentially people are going back and forth, and I posted this on my Instagram asking what people thought. Is Midnight's a breakup album, or is it truly just a concept album? Because, you know, we figured out from Taylor's Instagram post about Midnight's that Midnight's kind of came together while Joe and then Jack's fiance, now wife, were away filming their movie and so Taylor and Jack were left alone in New York and this is what they came up with. So I feel like that has a lot to do with it. She had a lot of time to reflect on herself and her relationship. So of course, you know, she's writing about it. Here's my really long little post that I wrote on Instagram in response to all of this and then I'm I'm gonna go into the details. So I think she was truly going through it, trying to make it work in any way that she could. So there could have been definitely moments where she felt like, like this is over, but then things would kind of be good again. And then she would be like, okay, we're good. Like, never mind. I think this is gonna work. So personally, I don't think this is a breakup album, but this is definitely her figuring out how she feels pre breakup. And like they always say, like a lot of times women know that the relationship is over over for a long time before it actually ends. They kind of mourn the end while they're in it. By the time it ends, they're like ready to leave most of the time. I'm not saying in all cases, but I think a lot of times that happens where they just kind of pain about it for a little bit, really, really fighting to make it work in the end. Because the thing is, when Midnight's was released, they were still together. She posted that reel explaining what Lavender Haze is about. It has since been taken down, but in that reel, she was talking about how her six-year relationship has made it through so many bumps and so many rumors and that she doesn't listen to all of it and she looks like she's talking in a positive way about her six-year relationship and that she just wanted to stay in the lavender haze and not worry about everybody else. So they were very much still together when she posted that reel. And then the reel was taken down, I think right around the time that they broke up, which is so wild. So she wrote You're Losing 
me a whole year before she released Midnight's. I think she was coming to terms with the fact that an end to the relationship could be possible because I feel like before that point, she thought it was it. That was it. There's no way that this is going to end. And I think probably when she hit this point during You're Losing Me and Writing Midnight's, she was realizing like, oh, maybe this won't last, which is a really like intense feeling. Hence, so many songs on Midnight's, you know, we've got the actual album and then we have the 7 a.m. tracks, we've got hits different, and now we have You're Losing Me. Girl was writing so much. And I think she chose not to include You're Losing Me on the album because of what that kind of insinuates. And they were very much still together when Midnight's came out. And then when they broke up, she was just like, okay, here you go. Here's the end of the story. I think she wasn't sure that that was going to be the end when she wrote You're Losing Me. And I think when they actually broke up and she released it from the vault earlier this year, that was like the nail in the coffin, honestly. She felt like maybe she was right in the end. Okay, so going into the lyrics here, I just have like, you know, sporadic notes here. So we're just gonna jump from song to song. But first we have Lavender Haze, which obviously we know she wrote about just like wanting to be in love and not worry about what everybody was saying, the paparazzi and like the headlines and everything. But at that line, talking about the 1950s shit they want from me, all they keep asking me is if I'm gonna be your bride. At first it sounded like she was the one who didn't want to get married. She's talking about it in such a way that's like, I'm not following that stereotype because I have my career. And then we see that when we get to Midnight Rain, he wanted it comfortable. I was making my own name. So if you listen to all the other songs on Midnight's Bejeweled, it's just like, I'm doing my thing. I don't need to get married. When You're Losing Me came out and she said, I wouldn't marry me either. Everyone was like, whoa. So maybe she wasn't the one who didn't want to get married. We were so wrong about that, I feel like. And I think she didn't want to deal with the fact that he didn't want to get married. So she kind of brushed it off and was like, well, I don't want to get married anyway. I wish people would stop asking me because you know, imagine asking someone like, why aren't you getting married when it's really not their decision. It's a two-way street. So even if she wanted to get married, it seems like he didn't want to. So imagine having all these people like speculating, oh, they're engaged. Oh, they're secretly married when in fact they're not married because he didn't want to marry her, which is literally so sad. Okay, so going on to Maroon, I just have this one line I wrote down and I know I feel like Maroon is very red coded, obviously maroon, red, those are like very, very stark parallels. So definitely could be something that took place in the red era, but it made me think about how she was talking about being alone in New York with Jack writing Midnight's and she has that line that says, and I lost you, the one I was dancing with in New York. And they spent a lot of time in New York early on in their relationship. And I feel like you're losing me, I lost you. She's alone in New York. They used to, you know, spend a lot of time there together. I just thought that might be something I feel like definitely her current life and feelings infiltrated these songs a hundred percent. Maybe like the inspiration and the full storyline come from different parts of her past, but I feel like there's no way that your own feelings, your present feelings don't permeate through that a little bit. That's just a hot take. I don't know. And then we've got Antihero where she's saying like, I'm the problem. It's me. Everyone agrees. I'm going to keep drawing parallels back to you're losing me. So when she's saying, I wouldn't marry me either a pathological people pleaser. She's putting it on herself. She's blaming herself and she does that a lot in these songs. Like, it's me. I'm the problem because everyone seems to have an issue being in a relationship with me so I must be the problem. But it's in a way that's like, again, like a people pleaser. If no one else is gonna take accountability, she's just gonna blame it on herself. And then, this was really interesting, on Jack's version of Antihero where I think it's, is it the Bleachers featuring the Bleachers? Anyways, it's one of those Antihero remixes where he has the second verse and he says, sometimes I feel like everybody is an art bro lately. People thought that that may, like in hindsight, he could be talking about a certain somebody who likes to post a lot of photography on their Instagram account. <laughs> 
And then he says, I just judge them on a hill. And at first when they like posted this remix, Taylor was like, I hope you're as confused as we are. The lyrics are confusing, but I feel like now it's kind of like, but are they confusing? Or do you just not want us to read into it too far? Cause then it says, talking shit about your famous baby pierced through the heart of 90s guilt. Taylor's famous. You know, I feel like I haven't talked at all about her relationship with Joe, but it did feel like he did not want to be Mr. Taylor Swift. He did not want people asking him about his relationship. He didn't want to talk about her success. I think he felt threatened by her success. There was an interview where somebody had asked him, I feel like this happened in the last year before they broke up, of course, but someone had asked them like, are you engaged or something? And he said, if I was, I wouldn't tell you. And I feel like that was so pointed and so unnecessarily cold because you're in a six year relationship. Obviously people are gonna ask you like, how's it going? Do you see a long-term future? And you're dating Taylor Swift, like the most famous successful woman on the planet. Of course they wanna ask you about her. And he just didn't seem proud to talk about her. It's like he didn't want her success to dull his success. So I don't know if it's like talking shit, but he's definitely not out there yelling from the rooftops how much he loved Taylor when they were in the relationship. Something to think about. So now I want to talk about Hits Different because I think at first I just thought this was like a fun song and also reminded me of like the Red Vault. And I think you know, it could have gone hand in hand with like message in a bottle in the very first night. She has the lyric, I pictured you with other girls in love, then threw up on the street. And apparently this came to light, at least to me recently, there's a photo somewhere in Ireland. Someone had painted on the wall that Taylor threw up in that corner. Taylor Swift threw up here and I'll put the picture here so you guys can see it. And that was in the summer of 2021. So some people think that's where that line originated. And then also when you get to the bridge of Hits Different, it says, I heard your key turn in the door down the hallway. Was that your key in the door? Is it okay? So that feels like tension. It's like he had a key to her place, but he had left and she doesn't know if he's come back. And because he's back, are things okay again? And this visual of, is that your key in the door down the hallway? Reminds me of the lyric from you're losing me, now you're running down the hallway. It seemed like when things got messy or bad, she would be like ready to leave or he would be ready to leave or it, you know, it was like, I'm walking out type of thing. And then it's not until like, this is gonna be over that he comes running back. So, you know, he's running down the hallway. And, and you're losing me, you can tell that the metaphor for that entire song is like someone is in the hospital and their heart is stopping. You know, when it goes flatlining, people are running down the hallway to save them. And that's kind of, I think, how she looked at this relationship. It wasn't until it was flatlining that he would run back and kind of try to make things all better. You know, is it okay? Are we good now? You're stable again. So this leads me to believe that there was a few breaks throughout the relationship. Maybe when she wrote You're Losing, me that could have been kind of a break or something but I know that you know going all the way back to Cornelia Street 2018 2019 I feel like there's a lot that we could pick up from that as well where I feel like Reputation was the only full album that was love songs and I feel like Reputation and Lover they're almost like the opposite of what you would think they are because I feel like Lover gives us so much more nuance into the relationship and not every single song is a happy love song Whereas on Reputation, it's just like, you're gorgeous, you're the king of my heart, you know, let's clean up bottles on New Year's Day together. It's all like really just like passionate beginning of relationship love and like I found the one for me. And then we get to love her and it was like, felt, you felt a little more anxiety about it. And that comes with Cordelia Street and Afterglow and a few other what like False God. There's like a lot more nuance and tension that kind of makes you think twice like, oh, maybe things weren't good all the time. Because in Cornelia Street, it seems like she tried to break up with him before he could leave her. Because she's saying, I thought you were leading me on. I packed my bags, left Cornelia Street before you even knew I was gone. And then, then he comes back and he fights for her to come back. And he says, then you called, showed your hand. I turned around before I hit the tunnel and we sat and we figured it out. So that was kind of like the first sign of a struggle. And then we've got Afterglow, which 
really plays into the same archetype as Antihero, where she's saying, it's all me in my head. I'm the one that burned us. Like, it's not your fault. It's my fault that I can't get out of my head and it's just everything that is wrong with me is making this go wrong. She's taking accountability for self-sabotaging, but maybe not everything was her fault. And then you get into the bridge of Afterglow and this is where, like, now I'm thinking about these songs differently, where she says, tell me that it's not my fault. Tell me that I'm all you want, even when I break your heart. Tell me that we're gonna be fine. It's like she's begging him to tell her that it's not in her head. She's not the problem. It's it's like we're gonna work out. We're gonna work this out together. I don't know. That is another thing to think about. So that is why I think they had probably a few, you know, times throughout the six years where they weren't together the entire time. Moving on to Sweet Nothing. Now this is a song that Taylor and Joe wrote together on Midnight's. And everyone originally thought they were writing this song about their own relationship, which I always thought would, was interesting because I feel like the songs that Joe co-wrote on were, you know, like the ones from Folklore and Evermore at least were like made up stories. I think listening to Sweet Nothing, all of us thought it was autobiographical, which ended up not being the case, which is so crazy that this also came out like the same day as all this stuff with You're Losing Me. It's about Paul McCartney. Like what? <laughs> There's a quote on Twitter that Taylor liked that confirmed that this song is about a quote that he said. He explained that he would write a poem on his run, morning run, and then he'd come home and tell his wife and she would say, what a mind, which is the exact lyric from the second verse of Sweet Nothing. So it's like undeniably about that. And also Paul McCartney and his wife spent a lot of time in Wicklow, you know, where she has the line that says, does it ever miss Wicklow sometimes? So that clears the air on Sweet Nothing because I think at first I was devastated. Not that it didn't mean as much because they broke up, but it was like sad to listen to because I thought like, wow, they really thought that was it and they didn't make it. But um, I actually like that this is not about them and that it is like, you know, one of those stories that Taylor likes to tell about other people's relationships. Okay, let's keep going through these songs on Midnight's, shall we? So we've got Bejeweled. I feel like the lyrics of this song, like when it first came out, I had a hard time deciding what the song was about, what she was referring to. But somebody pointed out this line that said, you were walking all over my peace of mind in the shoes I gave you as a present. That line is like a betrayal, but it's so quick that you like kind of miss that second part. It's like an afterthought. You were walking all over my peace of mind and in parentheses, in the shoes I gave you as a present. It's kind of like a jab that you don't pay attention to, but it's like, I don't know if there was actual shoes that Taylor bought for him or something, but I think that's a metaphor for like, she gave him so much and he kind of used it against her, which is so shitty. Putting someone first only works if you're in their top five. I think this can be said not just in her relationship, but probably like a lot of people in the entertainment industry, it's hard to know who to trust and who to put your energy towards, friendships, whatnot. But like, that was another lyric that's like, oh, did she put him first and he didn't put her first? Like, I don't know about that. Again, we know almost nothing about their actual relationship except for Taylor's lyrics because they were never out and about. And when they were, they were sprinting to the car. Joe was like dragging Taylor. I see that video and I'm just like, wow, she really lived like that for six years. And of course, I think it was really good for her to have a private relationship for a good amount of time. But then it it seemed like he was like hiding her like he <laughs> He, it's like he wanted to go back on the fact that Taylor was so famous and he couldn't handle it even though he knew what he was getting into. Like you don't just like date Taylor Swift and not want to be, you know, give up your privacy because that's just what it comes with. You know, I could never give you peace. There you go from folklore. Okay, we're getting into some of my favorite lyric parallels here. So Labyrinth, she sang Labyrinth as a surprise song towards the end of the tour. And I feel like after I saw that performance, I, I went back and I listened to Labyrinth so many times and the more I listen to it, the more I realize like this song is not exactly as I thought it was and it's not so cut and dry. It's not just like, oh, I'm falling in love. I thought the plane was going down. I thought like I was never finding love again and then you turned it around. But now when I listen to it, I'm thinking about that line, that, you know, I thought the plane was going down. How'd you turn it right around? It seems like in their relationship, if it was going down and things weren't going well, he'd figure out a way to turn it around and make it good again. And then she would just kind of like forget about it. Oh, how did you do that? 
how did you just turn this around and make it good again? That's, maybe it's not, I don't know. I just think that's another way to interpret that line. And I just think a bunch of little lines sprinkled throughout Midnight's, you can read it and it has more than one meaning for sure. The Great War, I have been thinking about the Great War for months. Ever since, I, I feel like in the middle of the summer, I was just thinking about the Great War and just how at first listen, at first glance, you think it's about this great triumph of a love story where it's like they survived the Great War, they won, love won in the end, they made it through all of the challenges and they're gonna be together forever now. But again, I was reading, I was really diving into lyrics, specifically the bridge. This parallel was drawn where she says, somewhere in the haze, got a sense I'd been betrayed. The haze kind of parallels to the lavender haze. So somewhere in that love haze, I felt I had been betrayed. So I don't want to throw out any like major allegations here, but maybe there was some someone else involved because there is a lyric in The Great War where it says, maybe it was ego swinging, maybe it was her. So I don't know if she thought, wrongly thought there was someone else, but there still could have been when she says, you know, somewhere in the haze got a sense I'd been betrayed. Your finger on my hairpin trigger. That line is pure poetry and I just recently figured out what a hairpin trigger was. And that is like the slightest thing to go wrong, like you will go off. So I feel like he was really testing her at that point. She was ready to go. Like your finger was on the hairpin trigger. You were treading on thin ice. So maybe she had confronted him there. It said, you looked up at me with honor and truth, broken and blue. So I think he might've been like told the truth, but he was really sad, broken about it, all broken up and blue. Blue is a symbol that Taylor uses for their relationship in so many songs from Lover on. They're so so many times she refers to the color blue as being just like a part of their relationship. It's blue the feeling I've got. I'm with you even if it makes me blue. There's so many lyrics there. Anyways, that's another thing. Then she says, so I called off the troops and that was the night I almost lost you. So it sounds like she forgave him because of his truth, him being truthful about whatever it was. And then also he was really sad and regretful about whatever it was that he did wrong. So she called off the troops and everything was good again. They had won the battle. Well, it seems like she had lost the battle, but anyways, <laughs> I'm gonna stay on the Great War for a another minute here. So she says, in this third verse, we can plant a memory garden, say a solemn prayer, place a poppy in my hair. So it seems like we can plant a memory garden to me sounds like we can lay it to rest. Whatever it is, whatever issue, conflict, it'll just live in the memory garden and that's where it will be. Say a prayer that this never happens again. There's no morning glory, it was war, it wasn't fair. So that's kind of her acknowledging like, some things are not fair when it comes to love and relationships and she just kind of like cut her losses there and then she says, Says, we will never go back. We will never go back to the bloodshed and I will always be yours if we survive the Great War. That is just interesting because like obviously they did not survive the Great War. So in the very, very end. So I think she thought they had done it. They, she thought they'd been through the worst of it and that it was, you know, they were good now. So I, do, I just want to know when she wrote each of these Midnight songs because I feel like that would totally change the way I think about all of these songs. Like was the Great War written before or after You're Losing Me? Because if she you know, wrote You're Losing Me and really thought it was over and then she wrote The Great War thinking, oh, they had survived that. I don't know. I have a few other fun parallels that I would love to draw for you guys. Um, this one is Folklore Evermore related and I don't know if this has anything to do with it because this was 2020. I don't know, I feel like maybe they had some things going on around then. This was in the pandemic, of course, tensions are high, but I just thought I'd throw this in there for you guys to think about. In Invisible String, she says, something wrapped all of my past mistakes in barbed wire. That is a very specific visual here, barbed wire. And then six months later, not even six months, five months later, she comes out with Evermore. And tolerate it, she says, where's that man who threw blankets over my barbed wire? I don't think that is unrelated. I think those are like direct lyric parallels there. Invisible string to tolerate it. I feel like that, those two songs probably describe the relationship beginning to end, like how it started, how it ended, which is so crazy. I feel like, yes, Joe was great 
in the beginning and he was exactly what she needed, like a breath of fresh air, a relationship she could count on, was stable. He was there for her in the worst time and I'm really glad she had him during, you know, the reputation and like all of that terrible, terrible stuff she was getting from the media. I feel like sometimes people get too comfortable. It's like, well, where did that guy go? Like, is he still here with us? Or has he stopped trying? Things aren't working anymore? Is he just giving up? Because we have this second verse of You're Losing Me where she says, how could you say that you love someone you can't tell is dying? I sent you signals and bit my nails down to the quick. My face was gray, but you wouldn't admit that we were sick. It's like all the signs were there. I just don't understand why, like, if you're unhappy, that you would just stay in it out of just like, you know, the history. They'd been together for so long that they were just together just to be together. I don't know. Honestly, like this is just me thinking out loud. I have no basis for knowing anything about this relationship. I'm talking about lyrics and just like, as if these were fictional people in her songs, because obviously we are never gonna know like the truth, probably. I mean, there's a lot Taylor tells us through her songs and everything, but I'm just way more invested in the lyrics and how they like connect to each other. And I think Taylor like appreciates when we pick up on these parallels because you know, she writes them for a reason. Okay, I just have a few more notes before I sign off because it is getting so dark outside and the lighting is now terrible. I wanted to talk about Hoax, which is the last track on Folklore. And again, we have this metaphor of the color blue, the lyrics saying, your faithless loves the only hoax I believe in. Don't want no other shade of blue but you. And this reminds me of in Gorgeous when she says, you make me so happy it turns back to sad. It's such a double-edged sword because she loves him so much that she will take the sadness with it. She doesn't want any other sadness in the world because she'd rather be sad over him than to not have him. I feel like that is such a complex emotion and one that's hard to like rationalize, I guess. The way she says faithless love, like unfaithful or f like faithless, like she doesn't have faith in it, but she believes in it, like it's a hoax. I don't know, I, this song, I still need to think more about this because I don't think I've quite figured it out yet, but I think this is another thing that's like, I know that she wrote these songs in 2020 and they're supposed to be, you know, f about fictional people, fictional feelings, but like obviously, like I said before, I feel like Taylor's the type of songwriter that her personal voice and feelings and emotions permeate everything that she does. And then in the bridge, she says, you know I left a part of me back in New York. And this was around the time that she left New York and went to London and lived there for a really long time. And in her recent interview with, you know, Time Person of the Year, she says, when all of that stuff happened with reputation and being canceled, she left the country and she lived in London for a long time. She didn't say London, but she said foreign country. And she's saying, I left a part of me back in New York. And it feels like, yes, she wanted to get away from all of the negativity and cancel culture and everything, but she also moved to London because that's where Joe lived. Again, she says, I left a part of myself back in New York. So I don't know if that's a metaphor for like, she like is missing a part of herself that she used to be before. And just like the entire Bridge of Hoax just really has me thinking, how could she write something like this if, if she didn't know what that feeling felt like? And she says like, it still hurts underneath my scars from when they pulled me apart, but what you did was just as dark. And I'm assuming when she says like, they pulled me apart is like the media and people canceling her, like they had deep scars and he knew those scars. So what he did was just as dark. What did he do? So anyways, this is why I think it's like they kept breaking up and getting back together. And like there was obviously a lot of things that we don't know about. Last few notes here. I think the context around her writing, You're Losing Me, is like crazy to think about because this is during Red Taylor's version release times. She wrote this song like I think like two weeks after Red came out and it's just insane because she was singing Champagne Problems in the white wedding dress that she wore in the I Bet You Think About Me video. You, you, I'm sure you guys have seen that video where she's singing Champagne Problems at this 
fitting for the white dress and she's in a wedding dress singing champagne problems just like probably like a month before she wrote you're losing me i'm telling you the girl was going through it at that point there was something going on if you watch back the all too well 10 snl performance she looks angry during that bridge she is scowling she looks so angry and she's singing, literally singing like about how this guy didn't show up to her birthday party. At the end of the bridge, she says, I watched the front door willing you to come and you never came. Just days before her birthday party that year. Now, I don't know if Joe was at her birthday party, but I'm guessing he wasn't because if she wrote You're Losing Me around that time, that means he was away doing his movie. He was at her birthday party. She's literally singing about a time in her life that was like the worst time ever and her boyfriend didn't come to her birthday party and he has the nerve not to come to her birthday party. And literally in You're Losing Me, she says, I'm the best thing at this party. Front lines, don't you ignore me. I am the best thing at this party. That is like one of my favorite lines from that whole song. So the context of that is just insane. So to end it out, we'll go back to You're Losing Me. She says, how long can we be a sad song? Like how long are we gonna drag this out? It's kind of like we both know this isn't working, so why why are we still together? This very last, ugh, this part where she says, choose something, babe, I've got nothing to believe unless you're choosing me. He didn't choose her. That is plain and simple. Maybe if he had alluded to a permanent future, she would have stayed, but he didn't. So it was time to go, pun intended. She says, my heart won't start anymore for you. Not that it won't start anymore at all, but for you, you're done. My heart won't start for you. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I have been talking for so long. Thank you guys for bearing with me here as I just like word vomited everything that I know and think about this whole situation. I just think I really love looking at the lyrics. You guys know this. I love a lyric breakdown. Let me know if you want me to go into more detail about any of the songs on Midnight's. I've already done Dear Reader, which is another one that I think is closely connected with this whole Midnight's is a pre-breakup. I would say Midnight's is like before a breakup happens where you're really contemplating if this is gonna last or if you should leave. So I'm not calling it a breakup album because there's like so many other songs on Midnight's that don't fit this narrative, but I would say like a lot of them have this little invisible string throughout that kind of connect to each other, this underlying contemplation of a relationship that has been good before, but maybe isn't good anymore. And that is the tea, everybody. All this to say, I love Taylor so much and I don't judge her for any of her relationship choices. I am 100% supportive of her as a person and whatever she needs to do to be happy. And I will say I do support her in her new relationship because it feels like a complete breath of fresh air. He is so proud to be dating Taylor Swift and that's all that we can ask for. He knows how important and smart, powerful and successful she is. He lets her be jeweled. And that is what is most important. So anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Let me know if you want me to chat about anything else. I am very curious about the Reputation Vault tracks. Taylor has said they're gonna be fire. And so I wonder if that will also give us a little bit more insight to that era. But again, thank you guys for being here and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.